so thank you to those of us who thank you to those of us is that would that be correct yes who are joining us for the first time uh this is the the second time that we've held the the hyperledger meetings and as you probably know already it's according to a geographic logic so that um, one meeting time is good for people for most of the us and also for continental europe and then the other time is good for the west coast and asia and africa because i know we have some some members in all of those um, uh, latter locations so all i wanted to do very quickly was to first of all get us to introduce ourselves um, because even though some of us are familiar, we already know that we have some uh, people joining us today who don't know each other. So my name is David McFadgen. I'm faculty at UCLA and I teach in several departments, so comparative literature and musicology and digital humanities. So I'll just go through the list according to the, the, the order in which they appear on the screen. So Kyle, quick words about who you are and what, maybe where you are. Yeah, I, I have an early stage startup in the Vancouver ecosystem working with New Ventures VC. Uh, and I developed a platform that, uh, JavaScript platform, that merges uh, databases and script as a hybrid. Uh, so that works really well with API systems. Uh, I'm now working on an initial product that is artist audience interactions, uh, will help um, with frictionless tipping. And uh, NFTs will eventually fit into the picture, but uh, maybe a year or so off. I don't know when, but you know, might as well start early. Yeah. Sebastian. Um, good evening, everyone. So, uh, just a quick uh, introduction for the three roles that I, uh, or three hats that I. Uh, where on the uh, uh, one hand, I'm the chairman um, and co-founder of the ICC Foundation. So uh, four years ago, we um, um, worked, started working on an identifier for digital media assets that could be generated from the media assets themselves, and uh, which is currently investigated by ISO uh, in a working group <clears throat> on um, identification. Um, the second um, uh, role is that I am uh, an entrepreneur and consultant in the media industries for the last 15 years, um, having mainly worked in book publishing as an, um, uh, in startups uh, regarding digital distribution. And since four years, I'm working on uh, blockchain related uh, projects for uh, uh, in this media uh, in environment. And since um, half a year, I'm also uh, a researcher, academic researcher at uh, the um, uh, University for Applied Science in um, Germany, um, uh, working on my PhD on um, uh, blockchain in the cultural industries and NFTs. Uh, who's next? Uh, Hamilton. Good evening, everybody. This is Hamilton Jordan um, from New York City. I'm a consultant at Deloitte, um, focused mainly on analytics and cognitive in the media and entertainment space. Uh, I'm actually the lead for eminence for our TMT blockchain group here. Uh, so I'm new to the specialist group and uh, happy to meet everybody. Thanks. Uh, Heidi. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, thank you again, David, for hosting and inviting me. Uh, I started about in 2016 with David, the Blockchain at UCLA initiative, and then uh, left that and went to co-found a nonprofit, which was the Los Angeles Blockchain Lab, which was a partnership of different centers at UCLA. University of Southern California, University of California, Irvine, LA City, LA County, and then um, some of the leading businesses in our area, including Panasonic and Lamborghini, to name a few. And our focus was helping to build a thriving blockchain ecosystem in Southern California. Um, and I also am a, when we have several 
uh, social impact focus initiatives as well. We primarily work with the business, academic, and government leaders. We're less community face facing and more uh, work with individuals from those entities that I mentioned above to help them either work on blockchain related projects and we would bring in students and um, researchers. So that's what we did for Lamborghini. And we basically help educate and provide resources for those leaders within our ecosystem. And then I am a co-founder of a startup um, and I have very exciting news. We've been, our goal was to help uh, artists, entertainers, amateur athletes and influencers to fundraise for their project, grow their communities and market using tokens and um, also obviously blockchain. And then uh, our great news is as of last week, uh, we were pinged by the drummer from Guns N' Roses to help create NFTs for some of his um, music that he has created on himself. himself. So <laughs> I'm now in the midst of all of the NFT uh, activity and uh, excited to work with all of you. Great, and that leaves John. <clears throat> Hello, um, my name is John Bauer. I'm currently uh, in Oakland uh, and I work at uh, Pandora, a music streaming service here in the US. Uh, I've been interested in blockchain probably since about uh, 2016 and then how it could apply to music industry stuff. Have dabbled in a bunch of uh, experiments, but uh, here for the conversation and uh, see where it goes. So nice to meet everyone. Fantastic. Uh, just to rattle through the, the official stuff, this will be the only part that is repetitious. So for those guys who are, uh, those of you who are here for the very first time, this is just to bring you up to speed with uh, the way that we'll be arranging the meetings in the future. So first of all, we had a meetup um, with the help of meetup. Uh, and you can see um, based on the, the link that's in the agenda, the kind of issues that came up. I don't particularly want to run through them now, but to a large degree, they, they duplicate what we'll be talking about today. And one of those is NFTs. So I yesterday attended um, an online uh, it, um, uh, Discord event, um, uh, a live stream, an audio stream, discuss, discussing some of the pros and cons of applying NFTs to the entertainment business. And I've put all of those links in the agenda. So um, once again, I won't bore you bore you with those now, but you can see the kind of things that came up on that. It was over 100 people attended. So as a general snapshot of the uh, matters that struck people as interesting, that um, that's the place to look. Um, regarding minutes, I, I, I'm not a big fan of bureaucracy at all. So if nobody, if everybody's okay, I won't provide detailed minutes. What I'll do is, first of all, the recording of every meeting goes up anyway. I can certainly tag it if people want me to just put in marks as to where particular themes come up. But I, I'm, I'm happy, or to be honest, I'd rather send you a, a summary every time of what we talked about. So sort of a pro summary as opposed to um, classic minutes. You know, next topic, you know why we're meeting every two weeks, as I said, because geographically one time suits some people and one time suits the other, although I don't see anybody here from Asia or Africa. So we've been let down by entire continents. And look, hopefully there'll be more people um, joining us next time from those locations. Uh, Hyperledger are keen for us to uh, start up a lab, a Hyperledger lab. If people are interested, let me know, because that's slightly something more of a, of a team endeavor, which would just means we get a dedicated GitHub, uh, GitHub account and a certain degree of support allocated to uh, the work that we decide to do. The closing date is coming uh, for very quickly, I think it's in the next few days for Hyperledger's mentorship program. So if any of you have a student or just a, maybe let's say a junior colleague who, to whom you'd like to give a grant to work on something of relevance to what we find collectively interesting, there's money for that. I'm told it runs to about five or $6,000. So if anybody thinks that that money could help um, somebody who's uh, sort of a future expert, that's one way to make it uh, easier for them to do so, maybe to grab the money now, but use it in the summer, let's say. Uh, next thing, in terms of where we meet, obviously we've got a choice of, of platform. So this is where we're operating for the moment. But Heidi, you said you had the idea of using Clubhouse, which I've, I've started to use quite recently myself. So what's the thinking there? 
Yes. Um, so Clubhouse, I've spent the past two weeks on um, just getting involved. It's been quite an eye-opening experience to hear the blockchain community and or those that are wanting to get into blockchain. And now when I say blockchain, for the most part, these groups are either Bitcoin cryptocurrency or the other group is talking NFTs. Um, I would, uh, and I brought this up to David, uh, we were thinking possibly about hosting a clubhouse event where we would bring in uh, leaders within the space that are working on something innovative. Um, so for example, we could bring in the CIO from MGM Studios. They had launched a blockchain based uh, product to help protect their IP in their distribution. And I think that they're also looking at NFTs, who isn't today, uh, and uh, they could perhaps be the, we could do sort of a fireside chat around that. And then maybe depending on how successful that is, host something every other week or once a week or partner with other clubhouse um, groups. Uh, the one thing though that I'm not sure, David, is I think clubhouse, it's totally open. So that means it would be open to the entire, whoever is on clubhouse to, to access it. So if privacy is important, then, you know, there, there's some areas around there. And my other concern is I'm not quite sure how to market to make sure that we have enough people in the audience. Because the last thing I would want to do is for us to host something and have more people on the panel than there are in the audience. So those are some things that I, I need to get some clarity around, but would love any feedback. Are you sure that, also are you sure, are you sure that um, the clubhouse is completely open? I'm pretty sure the homepage has that same we're in beta, go away yeah, and yeah. have an iPhone. Clubhouse is only iOS. Um, so that would preclude, <clears throat> that would exclude any uh, Android users. Uh, and I believe you still need an invite. Um, it's not a, unless they've opened it up now at this point. Um, also, you're discouraged from recording anything. So unlike these calls, we wouldn't be able to record the conversation. Um, but certainly there's plenty of people on there for interesting discussions. I've got five invites if anybody wants one. So if anybody is keen to investigate it, then ju just let me know. And I probably should have put clarity around that. What I meant is if we host a session or a room on Clubhouse, then anyone who's already a member of Clubhouse, I think can just enter that room. Yeah, I believe that's true. Okay. so. A logical extension of Heidi's observations then actually is the, the, the last point in, in official business before we open it up, which is with whom or would, with whom would we like to uh, converse, from whom would we like to hear? Because obviously um, different speakers will be of direct personal or professional benefit to different people. So I was approached by this guy, the Frenchman uh, Patrice Pujol, who recently published a book about, I, th that's what I linked to in the agenda, but he recently published a book about um, using blockchain in the Chinese film industry. So that, just given the size of that market, that struck me as an interesting guess. But is there anybody you think we should invite? Because I'd be happy to do it, unless of course you happen to know these people already. Anybody have any suggestions? John, would you be interested in speaking? Uh, I would. I don't know. Um, I don't know what about, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'd be happy could to be talk anything. about whatever could be, I know. Could be um, gardening or you know whatever. <laughs> but. but, but um, uh, Sorry, I was just going to say we can either just have you as a, if you like, as a as a mini guest, so we could give you some time and space within the meetings, or if you'd like more something more expansive, then we could advertise it separately. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'm happy to participate in anything. To be honest, uh, I just don't, uh, you know, just to be clear. I mean, besides the experiments that I, I ran at work, I don't have a ton of uh, recent experience, so I don't know um, if uh, if I have the expertise. Um, to speak on anything authoritatively, but uh, I'm happy to participate in, in whatever we, you know, whatever we do. 
Okay, well, just, just bear that in mind. Um, we'll hunt down people um, if nobody feels particularly inspired, and then we'll just put those names out for discussion and, and uh, selection or rejection. But whatever you would like, to, the, what, from whoever, who, whoever you would like to hear from, that's the correct grammar, um, don't feel shy and please let me know because um, the more variety and sort of the more, uh, the wider net we cast, the better. But this is the big question um, over and above the issue of hosting, which I'll get to in just a second. So this is primarily for, for Hamilton and for Kyle. What is it you would like to see this project become? Because what you'll notice is I just put up some of my work as a suggestion because I thought that what it could become would be a tool of general benefit. So I have a huge audio collection, about 2 million audio files. So it's, if you like, the history of the Russian recording industry from whatever happened 20 minutes ago to the beginning of the 20th century, I gave the donation to uh, a large museum in Los Angeles. So I was proposing you take that audio collection and then from that spin out two possible um, uh, interfaces or tools. One would be designed for a museum or a gallery. So in other words, uh, uh, an archival um, public facing entity and then the other one would be something that was dealing with live recording so you would have additional functionality such as let's say you know the nfts and micro payments etc 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 but if there's anything that you would like the project to become uh, become please let me know but as it stands today what were you hoping that this group might do or what might it create I can I can jump in here first. Um, so I've recently been um, uh, only just recently gotten involved. So I'm really here on a um, just kind of listen and learn uh, mode because any involvement that we have to do, I have to involve um, a lot of uh, additional folks to discuss what we're able to share and what we're able not to share. Um, so at at this moment, I'm you know just kind of going with the flow and seeing what um, opportunities there are for, for me to add value down the line. So what, what's, what's Deloitte's mission at the moment? Can you, could you possibly sketch the kind of um, interests that the company might have? Is it purely from an accounting point of view or is it, um, is, so is on the entertainment industry specifically interesting? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm in particularly in a media group. So my purview is purely within telecom media and entertainment. Um, and pretty narrowly focused more so on the media and entertainment side than on the telecom side. Um, that's not to say that the firm isn't looking at blockchain in a bunch of different ways. That's purely where the, the group that I'm working with is, is focused on. Because um, you know, there's quite a lot of work going into blockchain. Unfortunately, I don't think I can share any of the work that we're doing. Um, but uh, I think the idea, at least from uh, my perspective, is to really get a pulse on kind of where the technology is going and what sort of uh, additional research we might need to do. Um, and I have put out some feelers on my side to see if there's any interest in um, anyone bringing, you know, some knowledge to the table or, or being able to share some things that we've done in the marketplace. Oh, okay, good. Um, well, then hopefully we can give you something to, to something of interest to consider as well. Absolutely. Would you be willing to say, it's the last question, if I'm sort of dancing around the edge, is there a particular interest in film or in music, or is it just the actual, the, the technology that's potentially applicable to all of them? So I think it's it's a little bit of both. Um, it, the, the technology specifically, um, as, at where we've seen more movement recently, and by movement, I mean, uh, I'm speaking anecdotally from just conversations that I've had with other folks. It has been more active recently um, in music, but we're seeing applications being shared across industries, um, across functions. So just because something is initially being thought of for a particular industry um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's limited only to that. Sure. So 
you know, at, at this point, you know, we have a book of, you know, some um, applications, um, practical applications that we've, you know, thrown around as ideas, uh, but that's all they are right now. And there's no engineering, there's no money or anything behind it. Um, but that's not to say that that's going to be that way forever. So it sounds like you have more of an in investigative role at the moment. That's right. Got it. Um, Kyle, how about if you could tell us more about your work, because you're the, um, it sounds like the deepest into the NFTs. And then if you could also maybe hint at what you hope to get out of the group so that whatever we do serves you in the best possible way. Yeah, I think um, I mentioned NFTs, especially just because it's the topic of today. And uh, my reference point for NFTs is CryptoKitties. So I was paid attention and I went to the meetings when it blew up and that kind of thing in Vancouver and everyone was really excited. And I, But that's my context. So uh, it seems like it's developing, but it's still in this kind of inchoate state. So I'm just more curious about, I guess, investigative, kind of like, kind of like Deloitte when it comes to the NFTs. Um, but I was watching a DDEX uh, credit, uh, creator credit summit. And uh, the, the guy who runs it, he said, is anyone doing blockchain um, uh, for all these people doing these startups uh, for uh, DDEX? And uh, everyone was silent. No one's working on, on blockchain connected with DDEX. So I don't, uh, DDEX, it seems to be the biggest player right now in that area, but um, there are other ones as well. So I think that these uh, standards organizations for music, especially the ones that are taking PMA and, and all those other, um, I was in the music industry about 10 years ago on music publishing and I left, so I'm kind of uh, noting up again. Um, so yeah, so those have seemed, DDEX seems to be consolidating, but Sebastian I'm sure knows way more than um, me. No? Okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I thought maybe. But in any case, uh, that's, a, that's something I would be really interested in, in um, if uh, this, or this group saw how Hyperledger could work with uh, credits for people on um, productions. That's also an interest of mine in that uh, era. Um, the work that uh, we experimentally did was more around uh, rights ownership, but uh, me personally, I'm also very interested in uh, the credit side of things. Uh, yeah. How do you see, Kyle, how do you see the NFT space at the moment? Do you, do you consider it promising or overhyped or? Yeah, no, no, it's, it's definitely promising. Uh, it's just because of things like DDEX, th those are way more efficient. Uh, so they have some issues that they know that blockchain, should, blockchain can help them with. Uh, and then companies like Spotify if they're satisfied with that, then that's kind of a, a good enough fix right now. So I, I kind of feel like NFTs, um, when they have a, a, I don't really know. I mean, someone could come up with a great product, but it doesn't seem like there's anything right there right now. It seems like it's just more traditional metadata um, information supply chain stuff that's going on right now. And if NFTs haven't really become part and parcel, but Heidi's mentioned something that, you know, I didn't know about with, with uh, some, some musicians that are pushing the limit. So, so I just, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not perfect on the lay of the land. I just haven't really, other than CryptoKitties, I haven't been really, it seems like it's just kind of iterations of that underlying concept and it hasn't really ported over to music. Well, yeah. Whereas where with the, um, I know what Hyperledger is and I know what DDEX is and I see how DDEX wants some utility value from Hyperledger that, that's pre-existing. So it just really is a matter of connecting the organizations and getting a working group to start building together than um, something else, which is more inventive and and requires uh, R&D, which NFTs, I think, is a, that one, the R&D. What's, um, what's something that we could do that would help you? Uh, well, I connect with DDEX, for instance. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name right now off the top of my head, but uh, he's the, uh, um, oh, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'll just I'll c contact you later with this uh, particular individual. He's also on LinkedIn. I'll send you the, the link to that credit summit. And I'll also try to find the exact place where all these startups are saying, well, we're, we're working with this new uh, standard for DDAX, but none of us are working with how that could also integrate with uh, a decentralized ledger. But all of us are really interested because we see how that could be valuable to have a decentralized uh, information supply chain. So everyone knows that there's value there. There's just no one who uh, can actually spend the time working on it. 
Mm -hmm. Are you referring to the attribution? Is it the attribution extension or something for DDEX? The and I, I, there's three of them. There's three standards, but I, I don't know which one particularly. Uh, I, yeah, I have to. I have to go more into detail. It, it's been a while. So yeah. I didn't note up for this conversation. Yeah, sorry. Sebastian, how does that touch upon your work? Um, in in many regards. So uh, I think there are um, a few uh, different uh, aspects to the point of uh, NFT. So uh, first of all, um, uh, what I learned over the last years is that people come from use cases. And one of the questions that I would have regarding um, NFTs for uh, media, uh, for entertainment media, would be the use cases for for NFTs. I can see it in the visual art, of course, through the uh, through the hype and <clears throat> where there might be something like a value in collecting um, rare uh, digital assets. Uh, on the other hand, I, I, I've uh, I've been listening to a couple of podcasts and and having some conversations on Twitter where the 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 question was actually so if you would have uh, uh, MP3s or um, e ebooks or um, um, uh, 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 yeah these kind of um, assets would that be the same experience that you would have with rare um, visual or uh, visual art. Um, that that's that's one question that I'm struggling with. And in one podcast, I think it was the um, a colleague from a, a company called Mintable. He said that uh, uh, I'm not entirely sure, but but the, he he mentioned that it could be connected to other experiences that you would uh, uh, be acquiring when you when you have uh, or w when you purchase or license an NFT uh, for a song that you could have like a phone call with the artists or. Uh, like uh, associated uh, experiences uh, around uh, uh, where that exclusivity could play a, a more um, a dominant role or a, a more present uh, role. Um, so, so I'm I'm interested in your opinion about um, NFTs um, for these uh, entertainment media assets. Um, uh, there are some platforms that uh, uh, that started to uh, offer MP3s or songs. And um, uh, for me, from the like operational uh, point of view, the second thing that would interest me is to um, I couldn't read anything about the licensing terms. So uh, uh, when you talk about metadata, that's of course uh, um, uh, one is the product uh, uh, metadata. The other would be the rights expression um, uh, that needs to be codified in, in, in a way that suits this uh, medium. So that in, in, in that way that it needs to be machine uh, transactable. And, and um, if, if, you can, if you have to browse the website uh, for terms and to understand what you can do with the MP3 uh, once you uh, uh, purchase it, then it doesn't help you. And I couldn't find it. So would it be if I acquire an NFT for a song, would I get the distribution rights? Could I put it on YouTube, on Spotify, or would it just be that I would have the right to 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 play it? Or what sense would that make if I would be able to play the song on my own and no one else would could listen to it? Uh, so I I couldn't uh, I couldn't find the terms, and I think that that needs to be solved. Um, is, is, uh, among other uh, uh, things. And uh, the third uh, point that I would like to mention um, is that um, the, uh, the business model w uh, from the music industry uh, where they could use um, a a NFTs or, or let's say content uh, assets on uh, through blockchain. Um, uh, it's interesting because I think there are only a few uh, of these use cases. And, and one of them um, that uh, would interest me in particular is the aspect of uh, sync licensing. Um, uh, that, that uh, especially in the, in the context of, of uh, uh, TikTok and, and uh, social media, YouTube videos and, and uh, platforms, that uh, the Instagram videos that would, uh, I, I, I thought would have uh, triggered a demand for sync licenses for these kind of assets and where you couldn't potentially negotiate uh, licenses uh, on a manual basis. So the automated 
transaction through blockchain would make sense in that uh, in that use case and i was wondering if you would see that use case because we had that the discussion about it um and the other use case uh, I, i think that are uh, discussed in the metadata or ddex uh, context is the um issue of connecting um Uh, uh, rec record codes, uh, uh, ISRCs, ISWCs. So, in order to have the uh, composers uh, remunerated for their for, for for their work, I think that's something where does where blockchain in in various projects has been uh, investigated as as well. So um, that that's uh, these are the three points that that interest me uh, in the space. Um, Yeah, Otherwise, I with credits say, as especially if you uh, one last remark if you're dealing with uh, with entertainment media you would uh, could also go with uh, fungible tokens because you don't necessarily need to limit the uh, distribution any thoughts on that Kyle oh yeah sorry sorry for that uh, overlap but uh, yeah I was just thinking um, that uh, The whole point with having credits and DDEX and all that is so that money can get funneled to uh, people who worked on projects. So I definitely know of times 10 years or so ago where there was 2 million hung up because someone just wasn't there. There was metadata in one area that wasn't getting ported to metadata in another area. And so um, the Japanese PRO wouldn't hand it to the Canadian PRO, that kind of stuff, right? So um, DDEX hopefully is helping with that. But I, hearing from the community, they, they still think blockchain can really To help with it. The issue I, I'm thinking with the NFTs um, for possibly is would coming with Pandora and all that, would they actually um, allow the NFTs to be on their wall garden, um, their closed space, right? So they right now they're, they want the metadata, but they want it, it's their closed space. Um, so that's a question. Would they accept NFTs or, or do they want to do this system that's already well established or both what have you but that's i think another hurdle is that um these these market players have to buy in um uh, if, if we're going to supply to them uh, with the nfts but if we use it at this other layer um including micro payment um so if it's fungible uh, then that's not that's not an issue that has to be handled And John, somebody, you know, as the voice of Pandora, um, how does that question strike you, the possible inclusion or not of NFTs within um, canonical streaming services? Well, uh, let me be clear, and probably like the Deloitte situation, I, I uh, have no legal right to be the voice of Pandora here. <laughs> so uh, I'll just put that out there. Yeah. Uh, as a public company, I, I'm, I need to say that. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I think the interesting thing in what, what, you're, what you're mentioning is that um, the walled gardens are not really helping a lot of people, right? So um, while people may have their own uh, blockchain-driven solutions for an internal situation, it's kind of like the thing that we were looking at, um, really, I think to, to harness the power of this, what we need is participants across the industry. Um, and at least, you know, this was several years ago, we didn't see that much excitement when we presented something, uh, but, um, you know, maybe something just needs to get built and then people will buy in once it's there. Um, <clears throat> obviously we have our own IDs internally for, for music, but it's, we get the same catalog delivered that Spotify gets, that Apple Music gets, that, you know, uh, the labels is all delivered via DDEX to the same thing. So um, this has been a problem in digital delivery for 15 years, even before DDEX. Uh, every re digital retailer had their own ID system and everything. Um, you know, as far as tokens representing the music catalog of the world, um, I see lots of applications with that. And, uh, there's always going to be a question, I believe, of if a particular organization, a private organization creates that, um, either they're going to open it up or donate it to the world. So uh, I do think that the world needs um, a publicly accessible uh, set of tokens that represent all recorded music. It may sound like a lofty goal, but uh, you know, why not shoot for the moon? 
Um, and if and if a company is going to have their own personal interest in whatever that is, then it may be up to uh, an open source community to create something that could rival. Um, there's you know several private organizations that have started that want to um, you know Jax and all these things that want to create the metadata database for everything, and and that's extremely useful. Um, and and if someone pulls that off, uh, I would certainly pay for API access. So. I get it's a completely business, it's a business model. Um, when we get into NFTs and uh, tokens representing works, uh, unless it's a PRO, I, I always thought that maybe the PROs, at, you know, ASCAP, BMI, that they would be interested in having this sort of um, index. And I hesitate to say that people aren't working on this stuff either privately, um, but ultimately maybe it takes something out in the open um, to, to gather steam in which it becomes useful. I don't know. That's my personal opinion on it. Um, we have no plans that I know about at Pandora to do anything like that right now. If I may jump in, in because that was actually uh, the initial motivation for the for the ISCC. So, uh, I, and I think that uh, kind of is also described in the wiki um, of of, the, of this particular project regarding the the two million audio uh, files uh, that that uh, David donated to this um, museum. So, um, I think the starting point um, um, to to have that uh, like a, a registry um, uh, uh, would be the um, a way to uh, identify content decentrally. Which, which would uh, support exactly that use case that you just described. It would, uh, uh, because the ISCC in, in a certain way can be generated by anyone. So I, I've had discussions with uh, book publishers uh, that were, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, where uh, they, they would say, oh, we don't know how to generate um, uh, these ISCC for our works. And um, I, I said, maybe you don't have to because other parties have generated the ISCCs. So the identifier is not depending on the party that is actually uh, holding rights. That is the distinction that is very important. Uh, so it could be a distributor like um, uh, um, an audio uh, distributor. It could be you uh, um, uh, as Pandora. It could be Spotify. It could be anyone generating the ICC and then registering them uh, on a on a on a uh, on a blockchain and that's why the governance of the chain is important or a question um, because that uh, there are two uh, aspects to that one is to publish and to register and to de declare the ICC that would be done by an entity so that's uh, that's the one to 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 um, inc include the the ICC on a chain, and the other would be to be able to read it and maybe compare your library with the library of uh, of the blockchain, uh, whether you have complete catalog or whether you're missing some assets or these kind of uh, um, uh, things. So that's um, these are the two uh, two aspects, and basically, if you have um, uh, if you register. ICC on blockchains, then you can associate metadata, whatever you would like, uh, or whatever you have at hand. And I think that's uh, at least the, the idea to get to that uh, global repository of uh, metadata and rights information, uh, because anyone can contribute to that. And you would be able to be identifiable through your key pair, um, uh, uh, whether you would be entitled to provide valid uh, and verifiable metadata or not. So basically the idea would be uh, any track would have an ICC or any media asset would have an ICC and then different parties could could use the, the identifier as a, a reference point to associate their, uh, it could be reviews or metadata or rights management information um, published in the relation to their um, actor ID, which would be could be a decentralized ID, or it could be a, 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 a one of these um, identifiers that are coming up uh, at this point. And what would interest me in that in this project is that you actually with the two million um, assets, uh, you would have a good test case that you could set up and experiment with it and and actually provide uh, 
I mean, the generation of the ICC will probably be the, the very easy part. You can do it with a, with a, um, a command line tool already uh, now and, and generate the, the ICC for the, for the assets. But actually to provide the, the, the metadata and the information and then start thinking about the way that transactions can happen uh, that I think is a, is an interesting point to explore in this project. At least that's my my interest in in the project because uh, uh, to be honest, there have been a lot of um, blockchain related projects, um, but they are kind of isolated uh, proof of concepts uh, and not uh, not something interoperable um, uh, because you need the standardization for that. I, I think that's great. I think that. Um... Definitely the struggle that I've encountered uh, while pitching these sort of ideas. Um, and I think it's important for us to always ask ourselves is what can we do uniquely on a blockchain that we can't do with a traditional database, right? So yeah. uh, if, if we look at like these lofty goals, um, you know, Wikipedia is a perfect example of um, a global, you know, where uh, it, it builds itself, right? You know, you, you just let it sit back and after a few years, wow, there's a lot of content here, right? So you're always going to have to challenge yourself and say, well, you know, what can we do uniquely on a blockchain that you can't do on Wikipedia, right? Or something like that. And, and yeah. there are certainly things that you can do uniquely on a blockchain. But I think that as a, as a project, um, any idea should pass through that filter and whatever we identify as something unique, I think that's where the opportunity is. Like it's worth it to do, you know, this on the blockchain because it adds this value to it, right? Um, because to be honest, there's a lot of trade-off, at least in the systems that I've worked with, right? Where um, speed and throughput and all these things, you know, you're definitely giving up some of those things that you're used to in traditional technologies. But if, if you've got a use case where you gain on that uh, from the blockchain, uh, you, and, and not all use cases need speed or throughput or uh, any of these things, right? A distinction between the uh, b between the um, applications, I think, is important. And if you think about that, uh, like a decentralized registry, um, you don't need the throughput um, that you that you might be expected if you are dealing with co co consumer sales uh, uh, for, uh, let's say, uh, 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 content licensing or asset licensing. So if you would simply uh, have like uh, 8,000 uh, transaction per second or per minute or whatever, uh, you would do a benchmark there and instead of like 100,000 uh, transactions per, per second, uh, then this this would still be okay um, because that would not be critical. So I, I, I think that's where the, where the blockchain comes into play and adds uh, value. And the other thing is exactly what you described as the Wikipedia uh, use case that you that you have contributions from from several parties that uh, don't um, that might be competitors so it could be that that uh, there is a value that uh, that uh, I'm just making that up example but uh, but that uh, let's say Amazon and Apple or Spotify and and uh, Pandora or uh, um, Deezer and and uh, and Spotify could contribute uh, to an ecosystem uh, by providing uh, let's say reviews uh, or uh, um, or uh, links to metadata that are accurate or uh, uh, these kind of things to share that information might help to grow the ecosystem and and uh, so that that's where blockchain needs to come into play necessarily i would say because otherwise you would have some kind to, to, to have to establish some kind of organization that is a, is a like a head organization for for competing companies with all the antitrust uh, uh, things involved uh, uh, there. So I think blockchain opens up an opportunity in, in collaborating uh, without uh, colluding. <laughs> I don't know if that's- I think, uh, yeah, no, I hear you. I think that blockchain does give uh, some very specific advantages over over a shared, let's say a shared Wikipedia type system, right? So the audit trail, right? Especially in Hyperledger, right? Um, the audit trail would be extremely important when it comes to this kind of thing. And not just the traditional audit trail you'd get on a, on a website where you can't really trust who coded it, right? Yeah. Um, but a fully, you know, shared ledger in which you, you can guarantee that uh, 
you know exactly who changed what when and, and all those things right that that's critical um yeah and and i think that it's also one of these things where a, a shared um a shared ledger of let's say all of the musical works uh is one of those things that uh may not um it may not be obvious at this point like what you could do if you really had that right but why not build it you know if, if you have that um it'd be amazing to, amazing resource for the entire world and if you if you had the ability to write apis against it or things like that um the use cases would emerge you know along the way kind of thing and we tested it with uh with uh i think about 12 million um uh, um academic uh, uh, research content uh, so pdf 12 12 and a half million um pdfs but also with with uh, with other uh, media types to to get uh, familiar with the idea that that you would simply have this identifier on a on a blockchain and then you could associate uh, metadata to it or links to repositories where you would um have these uh metadata available uh, in your under your control of chain in order to have uh, control about uh, changes or these kind of things but still have some kind of a audit auditable uh, 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 trail because um, it, depending also on the network if you uh, you don't want to put content on the blockchain yourself uh, or itself uh, but but only maybe links to um, IPFS or to 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 other repositories. So and I think that's uh, for me that was an, a, a, a super uh, amazing ex experience to to have like different uh, people contributing to that uh, test uh, uh, case and and validating these transactions. So uh, I would uh, think I would like to see that. And I, I'm not uh, that would be my question to David uh, uh, about or to to the group uh, how that project could um, could be a bit more prototypey <laughs> so actually to get actually what you what you say I think that's the right approach to to have a look at uh, uh, what works and uh, what uh, what uh, experience would be uh, contributed to that uh, prototype and then um, decide on a on a certain track to actually do it and, and maybe get support from developers or um, uh, companies that would fund uh, like uh, the the needs for developing stuff. I can. Um, Sorry, yeah. No, please go ahead. I, would, I, I don't want to derail the conversation. I just uh, as we were talking about kind of, you know, what ideas could be there. I mean, I, I have maybe one or two very specific ideas that I've always wanted to build on a system like this. Um, so I could just, you know, if you don't mind say them and we could just move on if there's really idiotic. No, no, um, please. But in please. case it sparks. No, the, the, the silly. In case it sparks some interest. Mm -hmm. um, so I realize this may not apply to everybody, but uh, me personally, I'm a record collector. Um, collect lots of records. And uh, I've always been fascinated on the possibility of um, tokens for uh, existing vinyl records, uh, meaning that uh, <clears throat> not necessarily uh, things that are pressed today, which have UPCs and all those things, but I'm really interested in the pre-72 era, um, uh, pre-UPC you, you know, uh, era, and um, thinking about a way in which you could <clears throat> actually track the sale of used goods so, um, and assign ownership to used goods, right? So uh, vinyl is an example, but it could be any collectible. Um, and maybe use that with smart contracts to actually attribute uh, royalties to uh, used goods. Right now, there's nothing like that that happens, right? Um, an album that was created and sold in the 70s uh, gets passed around and resold, uh, you know, a bunch of times here nowadays. And uh, no one no one but the person who's immediately selling it uh, sees that. But uh, I've certainly dreamed of like a, a, a system like this that would actually uh, credit and track and pay um, artists for the resale of their goods. But you know, you can take that that and apply it to any, any collectible, but that's certainly something I've uh, looked into and tried to kind of uh, prototypally, you know, 
build something like that in uh, in Solidity a few years ago. But that that's you know kind of one idea, I guess. I mean, in, in essence, what you're talking about is something very. Oh no, no, Heidi, go on, please, please. Oh, I was just curious um, how that is different than some of the NFTs that are being built today, where, yeah, the tracking of resale is. Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, that's kind of why I brought it up. I, I think, uh, you know, when I was doing it, it was uh, just the NFT idea was not kind of a, a shared idea, um, but uh, it's basically the same thing. Um, you know, it's, it's a token, uh, you, you know, and you assign it to an item and uh, you can have a smart tr a smart contract around that item. And uh, all you really need is the tools then, and, and the adoption is of course critical, and you need the actual data um, there. But uh, I believe once you have the tools, this goes for any of these NFT things, once you have the tools, um, people contribute the data as they use it, and it just grows over time. It's nothing that needs to be instantly you know, populated in six months, it can take 10 years. Um, but uh, you know, it basically is the NFT idea. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting there is you're talking about a collaborative work of art, right? If you're talking about some of the work that some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the big auction houses like Christie's have done, one second. So when you're talking about two-dimensional visual works of art, right, paintings, prints, and so on, there are several galleries and big auction houses like Christie's that are doing the kind of things you're talking about. That's the provenance, right? That's the provenance of the work of art. But that's the work of art of one person. So I know that Heidi's been interested in things like, you know, the baseball cards and the sports collectibles and so on, which, once again, that's not the best example because they are, they're, not, they're not reused. You don't, you don't play a baseball card over and over again, right? But what's interesting about your use case of the album is, first of all, it's collaborative. So it belongs to many people or several people. In fact, a movie would be an even better idea, right? It's made by, I don't know, let's say 100 people, all of whom need to be paid. And it is reused. You play an album many times. It's streamed many times. You watch an album more than once. You don't use a painting more than once. So, yeah, exactly. I think there are some challenges there that are similar to what has been done, but are not yet solved in a... In a in a, um, on, on a substantial scale. I, I would just join in that, that, that the collaborative discussion is something that's very relevant. So a lot of muse uh, musicians, when they're creating, well, a lot, there aren't that many, but of those that are creating NFTs today, uh, one way in creating an NFT is it's not just the musical portion, but they're looking for a visual artist to put together perhaps like a, you know, a small digital video to accompany the art, the music. And then other artists are um, embedding within their NFTs QR codes to access other artists. So there's just a lot of collaboration and we're at the very, very beginning of this. And I think you bring up a good point, both David and John is how in the future are we tracking this information? perhaps user data would be something that's important um, to all of these collaborative initiatives. And then another person brought up in one of the groups that I was belonging to is the, the legal um, kind of what's trendy with, with, with younger musicians is this mashables, bringing different types of musicians in together and mashing them up to create a new type of song and so what are the legal ramifications around that i think you just bring up a very good use case that we're going to be seeing more and more of in the future i, I definitely think that the you know that the of all the things that we're bringing up right now again going back to what makes blockchain unique um ownership uh audibility right especially when it like you mentioned heidi legal um whether it's ownership or just contributions or splits or any of that, and payments. These are all things that you cannot do on Wikipedia, right? You can't, you can't have escrows, you can't automatically pay people, you can't, um, you can't guarantee the audit trail, all these things, right? So out of all these ideas that we're talking about, we're, we're bringing up very specific things that blockchain can do uniquely, you know, um, that you can't replicate in other environments. So um, my personal opinion is that that's where the opportunity is for this technology. Otherwise, you just do this, this idea somewhere else. But um, 
wh where this can really step in is is all those things. I mean, this kind of uh, loops uh, back. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go on, please, Kyle. Uh, I, 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 there is a distinction between the fixation as well uh, or the IP, right? So something I find really interesting about what John said with these old works is, yeah, it's tracking the fixation, which is inventory management um, in general, right? It's a physical object. But then I, I thought I heard you mention that uh, the artist would get some royalties from a resale. So that's what's really interesting to me then is that this fixed object that now is just like any other fixed object uh, has now come back into the world of IP uh, with that particular application there uh, where it's a collectible good like a baseball card, but also it has a, an ability to give someone royalties every time there's a, there's a sale. Yeah, and, and you know, if uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about that particular idea. So you can definitely go down the rabbit hole and, and there's uh, some brick walls that come up along that thought uh, experiment. But in general, it's one of those where like, even if it worked where, you know, you, gen you know, you, you give uh, Steven Tyler a, a check for a thousand dollars, you know, that's a thousand dollars that he isn't making today. Right. And uh, to me personally, um, I think that's an improvement. And if that were um, a system that grew over time, it would only become more and more valuable. Uh, but, you know, also you're talking about collectibles, especially physical goods. Um, they, unlike a digital good, they will degrade, right? And so um, passing, um, passing ownership of physical collectibles also has this idea of representing the, uh, the, the, the condition and all these things, right? And so there's an audibility trail too, in terms of as things, uh, as condition changes over time, right? Uh, whether it's a record, whether it's a teapot or, or whatever, right? Um, and if you tie that to um, identity, uh, you go to a flea market, right? If you can imagine any, everything in a flea market had a history and you, it's like a Carfax, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I'm not sure if that's a thing, but you know, a Carfax, you know, you go to, um, uh, a used car dealership on, um, in, in America and every, every, uh, car actually has this company that has like a detailed list of anytime it's been in an accident or anytime it's, you know, you may go buy this car and it looks great, but when you look at the car facts, it shows you that the, the doors were completely ripped off in an accident and they've been replaced or patched up and all this stuff, right? But if you, if you use the blockchain as like a car fax for collectible goods, right? There's this audit trail that uh, I think would add a lot of value to any type of collectible, you know, industry, right? And, and of course, if you can uh, track payments and things like that, or generate payments for people that have never participated in that. Um, I think it's an interesting concept. But. I've seen a little bit of work done there with Angie. I mean, which is, no, no, go on. Well, with records, of course, you have the first sale. So uh, uh, it, it would be the question whether you would, uh, in what way artists would, would gain from the resale of the physical uh, object if they are like uh, let's say uh, if if the digital twin would have been or the token would be transferred uh, or the, the the physical item would be transferred so that would make a difference uh, 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 probably for remuneration but what I think is I mean the music is out there it's on the streaming platforms I can generate an ICC or like I I, I could go to the blockchain and say uh, well, I actually want to have that record. Someone in the world must have uh, uh, must have uh, this record, and I, I want to make an offer. And that would be something that you could do. I mean, you can see that on Super Rare or OpenSea or what these guys that you that you can can uh, uh, the, uh, offer uh, make an offer for an NFT, and and that would be a, a super interesting thing if you have, let's say. Uh, it either digitized and generate the ID um, for your collection, or let's say only t take the 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 ID over and say, well, I own this record, and simply add this to the blockchain, and someone on the other part of the world could simply uh, um, uh, make you an offer for for your collection. I think that would be a totally interesting and a totally doable uh, 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 um, uh, use case to pursue definitely and it's also um, it relates to the uh, museum case that David mentioned in the Wikipedia because I, I like it's a totally different 
uh, industry, but but if you're dealing with archives or libraries, uh, what they do is like they 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 might have um, uh, assets that are also uh, in a collection of a different library, mm -hmm. like with books or with prints or with images or paintings or these kind of things. You would uh, you would have like a, a, um, the catalog, and they could match. The, the catalogs it's basically the same idea that you could say well for my collection there's a missing piece and I suddenly i know that there is an archive that has this piece and that could borrow it to me for this exhibition or something so it, it's a uh, it's the basic uh, principle is is uh, is the same and it it can be applied to either like a used uh, record um, uh, marketplace that could pull the data and uh, provide an, an uh, user interface for this kind of uh, a thing, or uh, like a library that could be supported, library work could be supported by the same principle. That's a very interesting, the library concept, Sebastian. I'm wondering, uh, is anybody on this call aware of any entity doing that? Because I would have thought that the NBA Top Shots, since they're pushing these visual moments as collectibles that they would also be generating some type of ledger, a library ledger of these NFTs. But if not, then that's a, that, that's a very relevant use case. They, they could certainly do it. Uh, they could certainly do it. Um, and and um, that, that would be interesting. Uh, to, to discuss with them if they would be interested if, if they I don't know their business model if they would uh, have like a proprietary um, kind of approach or whether they would like to open up uh, whatever they offer uh, that that would be interesting to discuss also with uh, with um, with uh, companies like Panini who are working with blockchain and Hyperledger um, uh, uh, in regards to their uh, digital collecting cards. So there are uh, like a few companies that are in the in the space and they're dealing with NFTs. Kyle, are you aware of Dapper Labs? Oh, I'm so sorry, David. I was going to say, unfortunately, I, I, I don't want to keep people. I'm, I'm learning a lot right now. So, what's that? What'd you say, Kyle? Oh, I, I didn't hear you. I thought I was just asking, do you know of Dapper Labs uh, because they came up with CryptoKitties and then obviously with Flow and Top Shots, are they creating any kind of library of the collectibles? So like as Sebastian was saying, you know, I've collected all of my um, Kobe Bryant video clips, except for one, I need to go find this missing one and who has it? Yeah, I, I still hang out with some people in the UBC blockchain community, and that's how I, I know them. Um, the gal who runs it was dating the guy who ran the whatever, so I'll, I'll ask her. Um, but yeah, I can't. I don't know off the top of my head, but it'd be cool to investigate that because that is an interesting question. Unfortunately, we should probably wrap things up because um, we're running a little after eight o'clock, um, and I'm sure Sebastian is completely hammered. Um, the, for me, the sort of the couple of takeaways, one, Sebastian had the idea of maybe making the project slightly more prototypical in the sense of actually building a prototype that could be clearly presented to external organizations. So I'll do that. But one thing that didn't come up that I'd really like to hear from people about is hosting. So purely because there's some attractive and useful uh, tools that are made of, made available to us. I suggested that we use the stuff that I, IBM produces, but then that ties you to their blockchain platform, which to my mind is very expensive. So I've asked them whether or not they would be willing to host all of this for free. But if anybody has any good ideas about alternative hosting options, that would be something that I think um, uh, several of us could, could benefit from. And I know it may sound, sound obvious, but uh, are we assuming that anything we build would be on Hyperledger? Uh, well, it was suggested by one of our um, uh, French members last time we met that portability is something that we should certainly consider. So two questions maybe that precede everything we're talking about is exactly what you've touched upon, which is one, is this best built on Hyperledger? Um, 
And according to a similar logic, if it is, is it sufficiently portable that you could move it away from Hyperledger? So I'd love to hear the I'd love to hear the pros and the cons. Yeah. I mean, so what what I've done is I've sketched uh, a possibility. It might not be the best one. So please, you know, the only way to test the validity of what we're doing is to hear the best possible arguments, and one of the counter arguments might be better. Sure. Okay. So thank you all for coming. Uh, your time is very much appreciated. Uh, as I've said, all of these uh, conversations get recorded. So I'm gonna put this back up online. So if you joined us late, there's certainly no need to think that you missed all of the news. Um, but in the meantime, thanks very much. Please keep the ideas coming and we'll speak face to face in a couple of weeks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. You too. Bye. See ya.